Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Ashu. In today's episode of Conversation, Dr. Eckler and I sit down with Dr. John Roberts and talk about his work with the International Medical Corps, and especially his work in Ukraine. It's a fantastic interview, and I can't wait for you to hear all the details about what he's been doing in that country and how you can get involved with the International Medical Corps. Meanwhile, don't forget ebmedicine.net for all of your continuing medical education needs. Whether you're in emergency medicine or urgent care medicine, there are three publications, Emergency Medicine Practice, Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice, and Evidence-Based Urgent Care. All three of those come with four hours of CME every month. Clinical pathways in every single issue, as well as five things that will change your practice and a points and pearls section, which summarizes the entire article. So lots and lots of resources in the palm of your hand in our mobile app in both the Apple and Google stores. And now on to Dr. Roberts. My name is John Roberts. I am the medical coordinator for the emergency response unit of International Medical Care. And everybody always asks, what does IMC do? And it's hard to collapse that down into a single sentence, but in short, IMC is a global humanitarian aid organization that works in about 30 to 35 countries, depending on the time of year. We have about 7,500 staff members locally. The reason why you may not have heard our name in the past is that about almost yeah, about 96% at my last check of all of our folks are local. So we don't send a lot of expats over places most of the time. Most of them are actually taken from the local community. And so they tend, we tend to have a fairly low profile in the U S or at least until recently, we deliver healthcare and other vital services during emergency responses to national disasters and conflicts. But most of our staff are actually in long-term country missions. So those are things like running a, a healthcare clinic in Zatri camp in Jordan or setting up ICU space in Sudan. We also have a ton of training programs in anything from basic humanitarian assistance to ultrasound, to COVID, to trauma, really. And so training is also a big thing of what we do as well. We are, like I said, all over the world, but until very recently, we weren't involved in the United States much at all. We've been involved since Katrina, but most of our work was done internationally, but with COVID all that changed. We turned our sights on, we turned our sights internally and we really were trying to look at ways that we could start getting involved in the United States. And so just recently we have started to really expand our profile in the U S. So in the coming year, months and years, you will hear more about us, but most of the time we keep a low profile. And by definition, all of the work that is done through the organization globally is medical or healthcare related, but not necessarily just an emergency relief. Like some of the things you mentioned there were setting up ICUs, doing public health education, doing primary care, doing emergency care, doing everything medical related, but not non-medical and not necessarily specialty specific. Is that right? Anything that goes into health is within our skill set. So think nutrition programs in the Horn of Africa. Think water sanitation and hygiene projects in the Middle East. Think gender-based violence interventions, mental health and psychosocial support. Anything that that is an input into somebody's health, we think of as our responsibility to try and help alleviate. That's amazing. And honestly, the scope of that is so large. I'm not even sure how you decide where to start in that kind of scenario. Well, it's, it's actually interesting. So all of our country programs, so I work for the emergency response unit. We are a very, very small subsection of our organization. So in the past, throughout our history, so we got started in 1984 by an ER doc from UCLA. He went over to Afghanistan back in the eighties and saw that there was a huge gap in medical education. And 
since then, we have actually been in Afghanistan since the start of our organization. And at one point, I think a third of all of the medical leadership in Afghanistan was trained by us. Wow. That ethos of going in during emergencies and setting up long-term programs is basically our modus operandi. Almost all of our long-term country missions that we have, we, at one time or another, we've been involved in 60 something different countries, but we are currently actively operating in about 30 right now, but almost all of those were actually started during some sort of emergency or crisis. And that's my job. So myself with the rest of the emergency response unit, which involves about 20 to 30 different people, depending on what project we're working on, we are the tip of the spear in terms of getting into a country. So if you look at the example of Ukraine, for instance, we've had a program running in Ukraine since, since 99, but we had a couple of years that we took off in the early two thousands. And it wasn't until 2014, I believe when the Donbass crisis restarted, when the Crimea crisis restarted, that's when we moved back in because we are a total donor driven organization. So if we don't have money to operate, we can't operate. And so we utilize crises and emergencies to gain resources, to help a patient, a population. And then we work in that country as long as we possibly can. In an ideal world, we would get into a country and we would work. We would start something during emergency response. We would get a large amount of consistent funding that would allow us to be in that country for a long period of time. But sometimes we don't get enough funds to work in a place. And one way or another, we are going to leave every country. You ask a lot of us and they say, what is your goal? What is the goal of your organization? And what I tell everybody is our goal is to put ourselves out of the business. We shouldn't have to exist anywhere. In an ideal world, every single government, every single area, every single people should have an adequate amount of healthcare services and healthcare related services. The fact that we have to exist is a problem. And one way or another, we are no longer going to be in a country. And in an ideal world, we come into a place, fill a gap, find a way for the local folks to fill that gap, and then we leave. But more often than not, the reason we end up having to leave a country is we don't have enough funding. And so wow. my job is to start and restart operations in countries and then hand it over to local teams mm. to continue that work. And those local teams are infinitely more important than what I do, but I really like my job. And we, we spent time talking about other countries, but there has been a presence in the U S here recently as well as recently as the tornado crisis in Kentucky. And there have been a couple of times when International Medical Corps has been required even within our own borders. Is that right? Absolutely. So like I mentioned, we got our start, our U.S. start in Katrina. And actually, crazy story, that is where I got my start in this job. Mm. So I'm from Mississippi originally, and my first ever disaster was Katrina. I was in college. I went out and was trying to help muck out houses and rebuild houses and try to help people. And I come across this massive field hospital in past Christian in this Walmart parking lot and this big IMC flag on the side of it. And I was like, I want to do what those guys are doing. That is what I want to be in this really difficult location, delivering services to people that need it. And so every single move that I made from there to now has been based around that experience. You know, IMC got its start in 2005 in Katrina. And then we were able to maintain a presence and we had some fairly significant responses. So think Hurricane Matthew, think Hurricane Ida, a lot of it's hurricanes in the United States. But then 2020, COVID. Mm -hmm. And the whole world changed. And the gaps in our healthcare delivery system were just laid out there for everybody to see. And we all of a sudden realized that we have a purpose here. The United States is it's the, the most powerful country in the world still. And hospitals weren't able to get masks 
Hospitals weren't able to get PPE. They weren't able to get ventilators or ultrasound machines or any of this other stuff. And we're like, well, we do this everywhere else in the world. Why can't we do this in the United States? And so what we did was, was we partnered with about 30 different hospitals to get them things that they needed. And it ranged from everywhere from PPE to ventilators, to high flow oxygen, to ultrasound machines. And we leveraged our procurement and logistics networks to be able to bring in a lot of supplies and equipment for COVID. And then since then, things have just accelerated. So we were able to partner with Kedron Community Health Center in South Los Angeles during the vaccine wave of COVID. And we helped them deliver their 200,000 vaccines into arms. We did a similar program in Corpus Christi, Texas. We helped respond to Hurricane Ida. And then most recently in Kentucky with the tornado outbreak. And so our emergency response unit is actively looking for more ways to get involved in the U S and abroad, but we will go wherever we're needed, whenever we're needed to fix the problems that are needed to be fixed. When you say respond to a disaster, what does that actually entail? Like the planning, logistics, the preparation, cause like disasters are going to happen. How do you guys actually get ready for that? And then how does it actually occur once something happens? So it's impossible to predict when most, when a lot of disasters are going to happen, right? You can't predict 2015 Nepal earthquake or the tsunami in Indonesia, right? You can't predict a lot of those things, but you know, during hurricane season that the U S is going to have between two and 10 major hurricanes that hit somewhere in the U S you know, that there's going to be another earthquake in Pakistan. You know, that there's going to be another hurricane that hits the Philippines. And so what we do is we look at historically what's happened and we look at historically what has been needed. And what we do is we build processes that enable us to speed up really, really quickly. We call, we call them in IMC and everybody's got their own name for them, but we call them mission ready packages. So for instance, let's say that another earthquake hits Haiti, right? Cause it's going to happen. It just, that's just what's going to happen. We have a set of processes and procedures and financial plans and staffing plans and everything else that is needed to govern our response to something. We have it already costed out. We know who we're going to need. We know what needs to be put on the ground and we have those ready. And so when something terrible happens, we send a very small assessment team. So it normally is myself and one of my logistics colleagues and one of our operations guys, and then somebody from admin that really knows the organization. And then normally somebody who really knows the area and they put us on the ground and we start assessing the situation. How many people are hurt? How many hospitals are destroyed? How many food distribution points are destroyed? Is there water damage? Is there damage to the sewer system? Is there damage to the water system? Where are the gaps that we can fill? And just as importantly, what does it need to be done? Mm. And once that starts, we start pinging our folks in those different areas and saying, okay, water's good, but this hospital's destroyed. Okay. Hospitals are good, but a bunch of personnel are hurt. We break things down by sector. So health, water shelter, nutrition, mental health. And then we break it down into our big four, which is, we call them the four S's it's staff stuff, space and systems. So in, for instance, health, which one of those is messed up? So in different disasters, maybe this, maybe the space is messed up. Like the building is messed up, but they still have all of their supplies. They still have all of their staff. Well, also we'll fix the space problem. Maybe all of their supplies got destroyed. Okay. We'll fix the supplies problem. Staffing's okay. Because what we don't want to do is we don't want to just start bringing in a bunch of unneeded stuff. And then the last part and the thing that we really harp on and the thing that kind of drives us is who is on the ground that's already doing this in country that is local that we can work through mm -hmm. because we are not there in a country that we don't already operate in. We're not already there. We don't understand the players. We don't understand the landscape. We don't understand maybe not even the culture. We may not speak the language. 
but there are folks doing good work there already that may just need funding or they may need some guidance or they may need a little bit of a boost in something. And we always try and work through local organizations before we start bringing in a bunch of expats. Now, recently you've spent maybe all of your time in Ukraine. So it's a war zone. How often does the International Medical Corps find itself in a literal war zone as opposed to just an area of natural disaster? It happens fairly frequently. And really what we find ourselves more often in than an actual like front lines war zone is these border areas of war zones. So we don't tend to do, we don't do war medicine. We don't do combat medicine in general. There are certainly exceptions and we're comfortable in those situations, but more often than not, we are in the humanitarian corridors around those active war zones. So we basically set up around the violence to receive the injured and fleeing and needs that are directly outside of the active conflict zone. So another example other than Ukraine is, for instance, the Tigray region in Ethiopia. We already had an entire country mission in Ethiopia and in Sudan, and we aren't in the fighting, but we are around the fighting. And our job is to receive injuries and casualties and refugees from that area and to make sure that they're taken care of. Mm -hmm. So it happens in active war zone, like in the conflict, less likely, but right outside of the shooting. And that's kind of where we live. And what kinds of things have you been doing here most recently during the conflict in Ukraine personally? Like what, what has International Medical Corps, of course, you said has been there since 1994, but what's been the mainstay of what your project has entailed here in the last few months? Well, so we were already in the eastern part of Ukraine when the, this new round of fighting started. When we were in the eastern part of Ukraine, we were doing a variety of services ranging from direct healthcare delivery to training of healthcare workers, to mobile mental health units, to gaining supplies. But that obviously changed drastically once the Russians started shelling the eastern part of the country. That program that was already there, we had to shut down and we moved it west into Lviv and Kyiv and Chernihiv and Stry and Venetia. But as the fighting has moved back east again, we have followed that fighting east. Mm. And so our response in Ukraine currently looks very different than it did before the fighting started. So we have spread our interventions out around several different sectors. So we have programming in direct healthcare delivery. We have programs in mental health and psychosocial support. We have programs in gender-based violence. We have nutrition programs. We have water sanitation and hygiene programs. And then we're also helping to run a cash assistance program in Ukraine. In addition to Ukraine programs, we have health programming in Poland. We have mental health, GBV, and, and several other programs in Poland as well. But to date, to give you high level numbers, we've reached about 3 million beneficiaries. We've supported about uh, over 120 healthcare facilities. We've distributed over a thousand specific health kits to hospitals. We've supported about 50,000 health consultations over a thousand MHPSS consultations, various gender-based violence, water sanitation and hygiene programs. But my favorite kind of cool thing that we're doing in Ukraine right now is we're actually helping retrofit hospitals in some of the conflict regions. So for instance, one of the big problems that people were having in hospitals is that when the shelling started, when you would have a missile that would fly anywhere in the country the air raid sirens would go off and everybody would run down to the basement and they would stop whatever they were doing, which is fine if it happens once a day, but when it happens three or four times a day and you work in an ICU and the ICU is on the fourth floor, you can't do your job. You can't take care of people. And so what we've been doing, what we've been helping some hospitals do is not only reinforce all of their windows with blast glass and blast doors, but also helping retrofit their hospitals so that they're functional during bombardments. So we moved all the ICUs down to the basement, moved the ED down to the basement, mm. L and D down to the basement. So that if you get a laboring mother and the air raid sirens go off, you're not going to leave that person. And so we tried to figure out a way to help doctors and nurses 
local docs and nurses and uh, nurse midwives to, to do their job, no matter what's going on. That was cool. The head of our mission over there is super creative. And he was like, why don't we just put the ICU in the basement? Why can't we do that? It was great. I'm going to interrupt for two seconds. You mentioned a couple of acronyms there. GBV stands for. Oh, I'm so sorry. Gender-based violence. So gender-based violence is actually a catch-all term that incorporates both violence against women or violence against men due to their gender somehow. So that would include things like interpersonal violence, intimate partner violence, rape, coerced sex, general mutilation, any violence that's done to a person based on either their gender or the power differential that comes with their gender. That's kind of what we think of as gender-based violence. And then MHPSS stands for? That is mental health and psychosocial support. So that incorporates everything from traditional mental health that you would think of in a psychologist's office or a psychiatrist's office or as an inpatient. But also we found that supporting programs that increase the support around the patient is also mental health, right? So it's not just about diagnosing schizophrenia, but it's also making sure that somebody knows that they're safe. So something that we call psychological first aid, these basic support things that support the person and that feed into somebody's mental health, we call psychosocial support. So anything that comes under any of those types of programs would be considered MHPSS. Great. Thank you. When we think about Ukraine, I think more recently there has been increased shelling of just civilian areas away from war zones. How is that impacting the work you're doing there in the country? Without getting political, because we try really hard to stay out of the politics of things, I can tell you that the targeting of civilian targets in war is a direct violation of international law and is forbidden when you look at the rules and the laws of war. Those are atrocities that, that not only harm the civilian population, but also demoralize the timber of the entire war. Those acts have caused an innumerable number of civilian casualties and has made our job significantly harder because it destroys the infrastructure that is required to take care of people. So people think of war, they think of gunshot wounds and crush injuries and blast injuries. They think of all these wounds of war, but when you start shelling sewer systems and hospitals and daycare centers and food distribution points, those casualties are infinitely worse than wounds of war. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't make clean water, then people get sick in the thousands. Whereas, the, and that's infinitely more people than you could kill with bombs and bullets. Mm -hmm. So the, the civilian casualties are always much more horrific because they are in such higher numbers. And that comes from the indiscriminate shelling of civilian targets. And that's one of the big tragedies of these wars. Is there anything else that makes this conflict different from some of the other places that you've worked, some of the other disasters that you've had to work? Yeah, we tend to work in low and middle income countries in general, more specifically low income countries. The reason we do is because those countries tend to have a lot more need for the types of services that we can provide. And there's a lot more low hanging fruit. So we can be a lot more efficient with our money because we can have a lot higher impact on those types of areas. However, the Ukraine is firmly a middle income country. When you're operating in a low income country that has two ICU beds in the entire country and one ventilator and no CT scanners, that's a really difficult situation to work in, but it's not as complex of a situation as a war in a middle-income country that has a massive and complex healthcare system, including complex financing systems, hospital networks, doctor's networks. The response 
necessarily has to change from one of, okay, this area needs everything to, okay, where are the gaps in the response? Because if you respond the same way in South Sudan as you do in Ukraine, not only are you going to frustrate yourself, but you're going to waste a lot of time. You're going to waste a lot of resources and a lot of people are going to die while you're trying to figure it out. So what we have done and what a lot of our partner organizations have done as well is that we've had to find the gap specifically and be much more targeted with our responses. Hmm. And that is, it's not easier or harder. It's just different and more complex and you, it requires a different mode of operating. For everyone who's listening and getting their introduction to the International Medical Corps, as they start to wrap their brains around, you know, how is it that me, a physician here in Florida, is capable of assisting in such an effort? Are there opportunities for healthcare providers to become involved personally, financially, through donations? Like, how is it that a typical person can then support the International Medical Corps? So the easiest and most direct way to help us out is to help us out with the resources that we need to deliver to our beneficiary populations. If you go to our website, there are multiple different buttons to donate and every single dollar I can guarantee you will go as directly as we possibly can to folks on the ground. We operate in about 30 countries in the world and if you want your donation to go somewhere specific, awesome. Just put that in the note. But what really helps us is what we call unrestricted funding, which is money that we can use to put where it's needed the most. Because everybody's thinking about Ukraine right now, but tomorrow it may be Indonesia. The next day it may be Ecuador. And so it helps us a lot to be able to utilize resources where they're needed the most. Mm -hmm. But on top of donating money or resources, the other way that you can help us out is donating your time. And there are hundreds of different ways to do that. We have a hundred and something different jobs that are currently waiting to be filled in every country that we work in. There are headquarters jobs to help us plan our emergency responses, but there are also volunteer positions. And this is actually what I want to, that what I want to highlight mm -hmm. is we have an emergency response roster, and this is a roster of pre-vetted, pre-qualified and pre-trained individuals that have a skill set in any number of areas. But the ones that are most applicable, I think to your listeners would probably be doctors, nurses, pharmacists, EMTs, and paramedics. We have an emergency response roster that basically what will happen is, is you sign up and you get into our system. We will train you to be a part of our system. It doesn't take long. It's about 15 to 20 hours of online modules, and then you become part of our roster. And so every single time we have an international deployment, we send out blasts to our roster that says, this is what's going on. This is what we're about to do. These are the opportunities to help us respond. And we rely so heavily on our roster to do everything from emergency medical teams responses, which is basically like a field hospital. That's what we did in Haiti. We brought a field hospital down to a rural part of Haiti after the last earthquake and set up a, basically a standalone ER where we did urgent and emergent care. We had a transport system into the local hospitals. We saw about 150 to 200 patients a day, and we staffed it in the first month completely with volunteers. I set up the first wave and then we had subsequent waves after that. And we operated there for about four to six months. And so there are responses in anything, in anything from that to actually our most recent project. And the one actually that we just handed over to our local team is a multifaceted trauma training program for the local doctors and nurses in Ukraine. And so what we are doing is we are delivering courses for doctors, nurses, and paramedics in trauma. So think ATLS, TNCC, and PHTLS. It's not those courses, but it's the same type of courses. It's primary and secondary survey. It's nursing trauma process. It's stabilization, intubation, chest tubes. This is all stuff that I know that your listeners are probably incredible at. And 
So we're actually utilizing our roster currently to staff those positions. And we actually just got finished teaching our first courses in Seabirdie and mass casualty management and stop the bleed. Mm. So if any of your listeners are educators or skilled at any of these areas or interested in helping us train the Ukrainian healthcare providers, we'd love to have you. We'll train you to help train and we'll be doing this project through late October. And so if anybody's interested, we'd love to have you. Emergency response roster is also a great place to get involved. You'll have to put up with me, unfortunately, because I'm the medical coordinator for our ERU, but it's an amazing opportunity and, and we really appreciate all the help. Is that education done remotely or is that done in country face-to-face -face with people? Oh, it's face-to-face. -face. We have two sites in Kyiv right now, and then we'll be going to Dnipro for two sites, and then we'll be going to Odessa for one site. And so that's in person. The goal is to train about 3,000 healthcare workers and civilians in trauma process, mass casualty, seaburn. Mm -hmm. And when someone deploys to go teach one of these education courses, a typical duration of the trip would be how long? So it's two weeks total. It's one week of teaching and then three days of travel on either side. Okay. The travel is, it's not difficult, but it's, there's multi-step. So we basically fly people into Poland. We truck from Poland to the border, from the border to your site area. So that takes about three days on either side. We have a massive security team and massive volunteer coordination team and logistics team that moves people from place to place. We pay for your travel. We pay for your housing. We give you a stipend. And uh, yeah, it's about two weeks of work or two weeks of one week of work, two weeks of deployment. Oh, that's totally doable. And what if there are physician assistants or nurse practitioners, there's opportunities for them as well? So it depends on which project we are working on and where we're operating because international regulations are so different regarding, especially the practice of advanced care providers or advanced practice practitioners. We utilize APPs as much as possible. But sometimes we're not allowed to have them operating at the top of their license, depending on what that healthcare landscape looks like in a particular country. So for instance, in Haiti, they don't recognize physicians, assistants, or nurse practitioners. Mm -hmm. So we had our nurse practitioners operating as basically nurse managers. And at least in California, where I live, our nurse practitioners operate fairly independently, but our ability to allow them to be autonomous is regulated by the countries with which we're working rather than our thoughts on their abilities, right? Sure. Because our NPs and PAs are incredible and we use them as much as possible. What's that look like in Ukraine specifically, if there's someone listening who wants to volunteer their time there, are they recognized as practitioners in Ukraine? Well, in terms of Ukraine for the training project, if you know how to do trauma, I don't care who you are. If you take an ATLS and you take care of trauma patients, that is not a problem. If you know how to teach, then we would love to have. Awesome. In terms of like direct care delivery in Ukraine, we are operating mostly through local partners. So we don't have any direct care positions open right now, but if you're a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant that knows how to teach ATLS or TNCC or PHTLS, we would love to have you. That's fantastic. I've done a few short-term medical missions in my career, and most of the time they are successful for brief windows of time. And then there's not any kind of longstanding presence or not any kind of meaningful change sustained in the area. We end up just creating a bunch of dependence on these teams that come intermittently. How would you describe the International Medical Corps' mission and work to combat that kind of presence where we just come and drop off some supplies, we're present for a couple of weeks and we're like, okay, we'll see you in another six months and see how things go. It sounds like what IMC is doing is quite a different approach. Absolutely. So whenever you're doing the type of work that we do, we are constantly in danger of doing more harm than good. Because the world is so complex now, the days that people just dropping stuff off and saying good luck, in terms of the way that the professionals do it is over. None of the organizations that we work with work that way anymore. And the reason why is the exact reason that you just mentioned. It doesn't do any good in the long term. And so a couple of ways that we go about this that 
mitigate as much as possible the harms of what we do are the first thing is we always work through the Ministry of Health or whatever ministry or government body is administering that type of care. If the Ministry of Health either doesn't have the ability to respond or isn't functional for whatever reason, we operate through local non-governmental organizations. So we are in what we consider an NGO. You would probably call them, a, we would probably call this a nonprofit. So we operate through local nonprofits and NGOs as much as we possibly can, because what we don't want to do is we don't want to set up a parallel system and we don't want to create a system that is not sustainable. And so we always work through our local partners as much as we can. We always do our best to fill gaps, but not take the place of the things that are already there. And we try as much as possible to maintain long-term presences in every country that we respond to, or if we personally do not maintain a presence, we make sure that whatever programming that we started is going to be continued by somebody. It may be the ministry of health. It may be local NGOs. It may be an international NGO, but we do our best to make sure that those patients and those responsibilities are handed over to somebody else that has buy-in and a stake in the health and the safety of those folks. All right, another question. Obviously, the conditions in Ukraine affect more than just the borders of that country. What are you seeing in the area around Ukraine and what has the International Medical Corps been doing in some of those areas surrounding the country? So, in your listeners may or may not be aware of kind of the, the ripple effects and the second and third and fourth order effects of this war, but Ukraine was to use the most salient example, the Ukraine was one of the biggest grain exporters of anywhere in the world, and they haven't been able to export grain since February. Some of you may have heard that, that they just got their first grain shipment out. It is impossible to overstate how devastating that is to a lot of the developing countries in the world. The Horn of Africa is currently going through a massive drought right now, and they have got a significant amount of their grain from places like Ukraine. And when you stop global supply chains, that completely disrupts the ability to get things where they're supposed to go. And as always, low income folks, low income countries. And minority populations and vulnerable populations are always the worst hit every single time. And that includes low and middle income countries. So the world is so networked now that the war in Ukraine has devastated populations in the Horn of Africa, has devastated populations in Southeast Asia. These are going to be the parts that last. Mm -hmm. And so we've already seen increased need in a lot of our other country programs because of this war. And so as a consequence, we've had to ramp up a lot of our programs, or we had to start to ramp up a lot of our other programs in other countries purely because of things like Ukraine, because nothing happens in a vacuum anymore. Mm -hmm. Wow. I find the big picture of this is so overwhelming, just like just the sheer volume of what you're doing, the amount of places that are there. To bring it to the micro, is there one thing that continues to really frustrate you about this job that you're continually humbled by? And is there one thing that, or even a couple of things that have just been really cool successes or triumphs that you never get tired of talking about? We'll start with the frustrating. You know, the frustrating part of what we, we and other humanitarian organizations do is that there is some stuff that we can do but other stuff that we have no control over. So it's exactly like being in the emergency department. I can fix somebody's DKA, but I can't make a healthcare system be better. So where that person knows how to take their insulin correctly. I can put a chest tube in a gunshot wound, but I can't change the conditions that made that happen. And that feeling of bailing water in a ship with a hole in it that you get when you're on a busy ER shift is the exact same feeling that we have a lot of is that we can't stop the flow of suffering and our job can only save lives and reduce it and reduce suffering. And 
when you stop and think about the massive amount of need that there is in the world, coupled with our, us as an organization's inability to fix a lot of the underlying problems, it can be overwhelming and it can be frustrating. But what we can do is advocate for those solutions and make sure that we're holding people accountable to fix the underlying problems that are causing these issues. We have a unique position to where we are on the front lines of unexplainable atrocities and sadness and hardship. And we try as much as possible to make people understand what the ramifications are for the situations and the conditions that are causing a lot of this suffering in as much as you've seen emergency docs be some of the people that have been the most vocal about gun violence, for instance, or healthcare reform. We're at the, the tip of this in a way that nobody else is. And we have the perspective on this that not a lot of people have. And so while it is incredibly frustrating to not be able to directly change the conditions that cause the suffering that we are dealing with. When we are doing our job correctly, we are affecting those situations by pointing people's faces toward it mm -hmm. and encouraging people to address these things and showing people what the need is. So it can be really frustrating, but the way that we get around it is to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and making sure that we're shedding light on these horrible things that are happening. And, and that's why I appreciate what y'all do so much because I can reach people one at a time. I can reach people in my own area, but y'all can reach thousands of people at a time. And the more people that know about this stuff, the more likely it is that we can change some of the underlying causes of healthcare inequality and famine and violence and all of these horrible conditions that cause the suffering that we have to do it. And so, so that's the, fr that's, that is continuously the frustrating part, but it's also really cool to watch things when they work correctly. And for instance, when you look at, for instance, Afghanistan, there are a lot of reasons to be really upset about it. But there are also a lot of wins that we specifically have gotten to celebrate over the years, whether that's training female doctors, training female midwives, putting people in positions of power, allowing people to, or providing people the capacity to be able to be leaders in the healthcare system and being able to pass along our knowledge to folks on an individual basis, one by one, as much as we possibly can and watching them go out and be those awesome folks that are changing the world. That is the coolest part. That's why I love training projects so much, because literally you're just giving people his knowledge and they are going out and just killing it. And it's just so cool to watch those things. And so that's my, one of my favorite things about this. That's amazing. I have one other quick follow-up question to that, which is, I think that for young doctors or like residents or medical students that listen to something like this, I think they're always like, okay, yeah, he can talk about this, but like, it would take forever to like get there. Like, I don't know how to even like get to like the place where John is now, like where he's gotten to this point in his career. Can you lay out your kind of career path for us starting from that hurricane? Just kind of a brief overview of the steps that you took. Cause I think it's a pretty straightforward pathway of just, if you keep getting involved, you'll keep being involved in some of the training you've had, some of the fellowships, like everything that I think that's going to be valuable for a lot of people that are interested in making this a bigger part of their career going forward. Absolutely. So I got into emergency medicine to do this. And so I was cursed with a clarity of vision from a young age. I got my start in Katrina. I was down on the coast and was mucking out this house and it was like a million degrees and the humidity was off the charts. And I was like, this is awesome. This is where I want to be. I want to be in the middle of this situation for the rest of my life. And so I ended up going to medical school because of that. I went to emergency medicine residency because of that. And the, when I was in residency, I sought out opportunities to get involved in this 
work. And so I was really blessed with really good mentors in through ASAP and through SAEM actually. So, uh, you know, everyone at G the GEMA Academy at SAM, they were amazing. ASAP has an international section. They have a disaster section. SAM has a disaster section. Everybody from Scott Weiner to Janet Lynn to Sean Kevlahan over at HHI, those folks were the people that showed me that this was doable and you can make this part of your career if you want to. Now it does take some doing and you have to prioritize it, but it is, it is incredibly doable. We actually ended up writing a book and shameless self plug. We ended up writing a, like a book called the nuts and bolts of global emergency medicine with about 20 or 30 different authors in residency. And it's actually available on the Emmer website. We download it for free. It's basically like a, this is how you get involved. And it goes through things like, should I do a fellowship? What type of fellowship should I do? What kind of elective should I do? And it breaks down the journey. Now it was done back in 2014, so it may need some updating, but definitely go out, go and check that out. I was torn for instance, between doing disaster medicine fellowship and international emergency medicine fellowship. And I, it, in the end, I don't think it would have mattered <laughs> because when I, so I ended up choosing to, I did my disaster medicine fellowship over at Carolinas in Charlotte. And so it was a two-year fellowship. They paid for my MPH and I got to be deployed half of my fellowship with team Rubicon. And uh, so I was one of their medical directors along with Aaron Nost and Dave Calloway for two years in fellowship. And so I was, I got to be on the ground multiple different times and placed in leadership positions that I would not have gotten placed in if I had not gone to fellowship. But regardless of whether fellowship is right for you or you think that it's worth it, or maybe you have loans you got to go pay back because you got to work in the community. Totally, totally hear you. It's doable and it's just takes looking for the right fit that fits your lifestyle. And the fellowship route was the one that was right for me. I worked with TR for a couple of years, for about two and a half or three years, and then went and worked with AmeriCares for a very short amount of time until COVID started. And then IMC reached out to me because they were designing one of their medical teams, which I had done with TR before, and they brought me over here with them and I've been working with them ever since. And so in a nutshell, take a look at SAM, take a look at ASEP's international disaster sections, email me. I'm always available. I'm happy to talk to anybody that wants to talk. That is, like I said, I love, as you all notice, I love talking about this stuff and I wouldn't be where I am now without a bunch of people telling me how to do it. And so I want to help pay that forward. So anybody who's interested, I'd love to talk to them and yeah, bring you in. It's a blast. It's a great job. That's awesome. Well, hey, thank you really for taking the time to talk to us and the, to share that wealth of knowledge. If you are open to it, I'd love to have you back on the podcast sometime in the future, just to give us an update on what you're doing in Ukraine, wherever the need may be at that point, and let us stay in touch with you and the International Medical Corps. And for all of you listening, in the show notes, we will include the links to the IMC website, ways to donate, the nuts and bolts of Global EM ebook link, and all of those resources so that they'll be right at your fingertips as you're listening. Well, that's a wrap, everyone. Thanks for listening. Don't forget ebmedicine.net for all your CME needs, emergency medicine, pediatric emergency medicine, and urgent care medicine, all there at your fingertips in the mobile app. Until next time, I'm your host, Sam Ashu. Be safe, everyone.